those troublesome books where it speaks and you feel convicted. Do you know what I mean? Maybe you're perfect and you don't have that problem. <laughs> um, uh, but um, it's, it's a, I don't know what you noticed, but it's, it's a little bit hodgepodge. Did you catch that? Um, so he talks about one thing and then he kind of talks about something else and then he talks about something else. James does that throughout the whole letter. And so you'll have noticed on the bookmarks, um, we give you these bookmarks because we, we'd actually really love it if you dug into the book of James with us as we go. Um, and we've given you the readings ahead of time. And if, you, if you're one of those people who notice details, you'll notice that we're not following chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. And the reason is, is that James really is a chapter 1, um, uh, is a kind of setup of the themes. And then there's, scholars disagree on the number, but there's about 12 little talks that don't run together. Um, they're just kind of bits. It's like a mosaic um, in the rest of James. Um, I don't think it's written very well, but don't tell my lecturers that I say that. Um, uh, but uh, but I think I think the, the content is brilliant, but it kind of p patches itself around. So Adrian and Billy and I have put together, um, have combined these talks into five sections that we think run quite well together. Um, and so we're going to look at those five over the next five weeks. Um, so you'll notice that next week we do a little bit of chapter two, but we do a little bit of chapter three, and then the next week we do chapter five, and then so on and so forth, because we've combined things that we think work well. But we will cover the whole, whole book in that time. Um, is that all right? Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so take one of those home, put it in your Bible, um, grab some time to read the Word. Um, I, I want to I start this um, uh, talk with a bit of a history lesson, um, and then I'm going to sort of dive into uh, something that I think that the whole of the book of James is about, that the first chapter sets out. Um, I, I've done um, most of my talk comes from an inspiration from Douglas Moo, who um, wrote a, a, a great commentary on James, and also from a sermon from Tim Keller on change, um, if you're interested in where I'm stealing my quotes from. Um, but uh, but the, what I want to start with is, um, I don't know if you know this, but the, the, the early church fathers gathered together a number of times to decide what should be in the New Testament. Yeah, are you aware that this took place? So in the early centuries, they gathered together and they made what's called canonical lists, what should be in the canon of the Bible. Um, you know, so that's the Gospels and the letters from Paul and, and so on and so forth. And for the first 200 years of these canonical lists, James doesn't feature at all. And then it features, and no one disputes it, until the Reformation. And at the Reformation, um, uh, Martin Luther is translating the Bible into German, and he states, this is a quote from him, but it's in German, so you don't have to ask for the German version. But he says that James is an epistle of straw and shouldn't be in the Bible. <laughs> That's a big claim, eh? And then at the end of the uh, 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, a bunch of scholars picking up on what Luther was saying and recognizing that James didn't appear in the first 200 years of lists decided to start suggesting that that was because James wasn't written until the 2nd or 3rd century. And so therefore it's not legit, it's not, it shouldn't be part of the Bible, it's just a comment of some church leader later. I think they're all wrong. And I'm going to explain why. Um, and there's two things I think why, and I'm not, I'm, this is not Caleb being very clever, I've only read a few books. Um, but um, uh, 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 I think it hinges on two things. One is, who is James? And I think that's important for our passage today. So who is James? And then I've got some thoughts which narrow us down to actually um, not just being, it's not written in 200 or 300 years, but actually I think this is the earliest book that was written in the New Testament. Before the Gospels, before any letters of Paul, this book was written. Um, and uh, so the, the first part of that is that um, uh, we've got to figure out who James is. Now there's lots of Jameses in the New Testament, I don't know if you notice that. Two of them are his disciples. Um, but there are two prominent Jameses. Um, and one of them is one of his disciples, that's the brother of John, you know, and he and Peter, uh, James and John, they're the sort of intimate three that go up Mount Transfiguration and go deep into Gethsemane together. Um, well, I don't think it was that James, because he dies really quickly in, in, in our historical documents. Um, uh, but there's another James that is talked about in the Acts of the Apostles, and he's the first leader of the church. So when the church gathered together in Jerusalem, they make a bishop, and their first bishop is this guy called James, who happens to be the brother of Jesus. Now it's significant that it's the brother of Jesus because this brother of Jesus grew up with Jesus as an older brother. How annoying would that have been? You know, he always got things right. Um, and, and, um, you know, and so you know, he grew up with Jesus and would have seen Jesus traveling around the country performing miraculous signs and wonders. But this James did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And 
until the resurrection. Interesting, eh? There's this little snippet of a story in 1 Corinthians 15 where it talks about Jesus going around and having his appearances post-resurrection. So we've had Jesus rise from the dead. He appears to the women. He meets with Peter. He meets with the disciples. It says he met with many other women and men and 500 people at one moment. And then he met with James. Gosh, I would have loved to have been in that conversation. You know? Sorry, buddy. I am God. You know? Um, you know, you know like, what would that have been like if something happened in that conversation, something that resonated that probably James had been wrestling with his whole life, is who is my brother and what is this about? Um, and then he comes to this position where they elevate him to be the first leader of the church. And that's who I think is declaring this authority. That's why he speaks with such authority to the church, is because it's this James. And there's two other things that I think that lead us to a, a very early date. Um, and the first is that this James dies in AD 62. So he has to write it before then, obviously. Um, uh, so, um, but it doesn't feel like a second generation book like Hebrews or Revelation or the Gospel of John. It actually feels like an earlier book in the way that it describes theology. And that doesn't have very much theology at all. It's very, very practical. Um, uh, but uh, the key thing for me is that if James is the, the leader of the church, in AD 48-49... I don't know if you remember, there's this story in Acts 15, right, where um, the Holy Spirit has burst out into the Gentiles. Do you remember this? Peter's up on the roof and the sheep comes down and he's told to go and he goes to see these Gentiles. And basically what happens is he goes to these Gentiles, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they fall flat on the floor, they start speaking in tongues, healings and miraculous signs and wonders occur. And they're like, oh my goodness, it happens in the Gentiles as well. And so they come back to Jerusalem and they have a fiery debate for a little while about whether God can meet with people who are not Jews. And James is the one who chairs that meeting. And at the end of that meeting, they decide it's okay for Gentiles to be Christians. It's okay for them to follow God. And here are some rituals that they have to follow. They don't have to do circumcision. They don't have to do this and that. But they have to do these things. And it becomes very important. And you see that through a number of Paul's letters about what they have to do, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. But James doesn't occur... There's no mention of them at all. Which in my book puts it must be before that meeting. Are you with me? So we're talking before 47. That's really early. The second thing which I think narrows us down to about two or three years is that he uses this phrase, um, which you probably know, is that he uses the phrase, faith without deeds is dead. Yeah? You know that one? This is where James does his little spell where he says, you can't just believe in God, you have to live it out. Yeah? It's about obedience and living out the way of God. Yeah, which is um, something that on the surface seems to be contradicting Paul's message in all of his letters, where Paul talks about justification by faith. He talks about that you're, you're saved, not by earning, but by your faith in Jesus. Are you with me? This is a bit of a, a, a condensed history lesson in one go. But, um, um, because he's going and talking about that stuff, I think James is responding to him. Now, don't get me wrong, I think James and Paul probably reconciled at that meeting where it was all about the Holy Spirit and all of those things and Gentiles and stuff, um, in 47, 48. But I think that what would have happened is Paul would have gone out talking to people, yeah, and telling people this message, and it would have trickled back to Jerusalem. And James would have gone, wait a minute, are you telling me that all we need is faith and that no obedience and no caring for the poor matters? And that's why he writes this letter. Yeah? But here's the key bit. Paul becomes a Christian in AD 33, the year of all years. Okay, death, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost, persecution, Paul on the road to Damascus, all occurs in that one year. I mean, wow, yeah? And then what happens is Paul disappears for over a decade. You know? He goes off into the desert to disappear because he needs to figure out everything he's previously thought now has to fit into Jesus. Do you know what I mean? And it takes him over 10 years to do so. So we're talking that the earliest that he could have come and started preaching is the early 40s. So we're talking that this book is written somewhere between probably 44 and 47. Do you believe me? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a historian, but um, I, uh, that's, uh, that's what makes sense to me from um, reading a bunch of different things. But I, but I love that. We've got this little snippet in time. He's writing, and I think it's key for us to, to, to see that it's in the 40s. Because in the 40s, there's some significant things that are happening in history at that moment in time. So one is the church is being persecuted. They're on the run, and they're in hiding. And they've been scattered across the known world. 
The second is that there is huge political, social and economic unrest which leads to troubles. There is drought in Judea in the mid-40s and it's carnage. And it seems to me that this letter is written to hold firm to obedience in that time. Did you catch that first phrase which he talks about where he says, whenever you face trials of any kind, did you catch that bit? Consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. He's writing this at a time when there's difficulty in the economy, amongst the communities of people, in persecution, all of that's going on, people having to move places, be displaced from their home. All of that is taking place in that space, he says, hold firm to obedience. Be disciples of Jesus. Walk in Jesus' way. That's what he's teaching in that place. And it's interesting, because it's the same place we stand. Yeah? There's global economic unrest. There are countries that are in disrepair. Never before has there been such stark distances between the poorest people in the world and the richest. Ever before. <coughs> Never before have we had so many people displaced and moved. There are millions upon millions of people who've lost their homes, right now are homeless, because of war, because of political unrest, because of the effects of global warming. They've lost their homes. It's huge. And in that space, this word comes to us. We, at this time, as in all of history, need to answer the question of the carnage. And I've got three quotes from Dallas Willard, who's my favourite author, um, after Jesus, obviously, of course. Um, and Dallas says this, he says, The greatest issue facing the world today, with all its heartbreaking needs, is whether those by professional culture identify as Christians <coughs> will become disciples, students, apprentices of Jesus, learning from Jesus how to live in the kingdom into every corner of human existence. That's all we've forgotten to do as the church. <coughs> we've forgotten to make disciples. We've forgotten to learn how to live in the way of Jesus into every part of this world. If we do that, man, that would be amazing. There's two other quotes from Dallas. He says the answer is actually rather simple. One must intend to follow Jesus, and then one must implement the means to follow Jesus. Yeah? Last quote, one of my favourite ones from Dallas. He says, there's not a single thing wrong in the church that discipleship to Jesus cannot cure. You get it? I'll say it again because it's good. There's not a single thing wrong in the church that discipleship to Jesus cannot cure. That's what James is saying. He's saying, step into the way of Jesus. If you step into the way of Jesus, this whole world changes. Everything changes. Now, I don't want you to go away from this thinking that Caleb's saying, um, you've got to try harder, team, and you've got to do better than you're doing. Okay, please don't hear that message. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're not good enough. That's so far from what I'm saying. All of this stuff that James teaches begins in verse 1. I don't know if you noticed this wonderful first sentence. And it's actually a sentence that I've meditated on for hours and hours and hours over the last decade. And I'll just read you the first bit. It says this, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it look like to be a servant of God? Let alone a servant of your brother. Anyone else squirming in their stomach? I am. <coughs> what does it look like to be a servant of God? And a servant of your brother, we have to start in this incredible place of humility to Jesus. A place of saying, Jesus, you are my Lord. He says that. He says that of his brother. He says he's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord of everything. Sovereign over all. At that place we sit. We have to have Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. We have to know he's not only good at that, but he's beautiful in that place. Our identity is a servant. Did you see that? He didn't say, oh, just in my role as the first bishop and leader of the Church of Jerusalem, I serve God. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm a servant. James, a servant of God. It's his identity. If we don't start with this as our identity, as Jesus as Lord, as one with whom Christ chooses to dwell, 
as one who is in Christ, as one who is loved by and responds by love, as one who has my name in the book of life. I've got my name on the heart of Jesus, on his breastplate before the Father is my name. Your name's there too. If we start with that identity, then we can do three things. But if we don't start with that identity, we can't do the three things I'm about to describe that um, I see in this first chapter of James. The first thing we can't do if we don't start with that identity First thing we can't do is we can't admit where we're wrong. Yeah? If I think that my identity is as a good person, have you ever said that about yourself? Oh, no, I'm a good person. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yep. if, we, if our identity is as a good person, then when we fail, it either crushes us or we crush it. Yeah? We have to have our identity with Jesus being our Lord. If Jesus is our Lord, then it's okay that I've got this. We'll unpack that more in a minute. These are my three points for the rest of the sermon. So we cannot admit how we are not living in God's way. The second is, if we don't have this as our identity, we can't avoid the false solutions. We always put false solutions in our way. The main one being trying to squish our sins, and I'll talk about that more. And then the third is, we can't deploy the true solutions. If we do have him as our identity, if we do have it, that is what I am. I'm loved by God. Then I can admit where I'm wrong. I can avoid the false uh, solutions and I can deploy the true solutions. You interested in dealing with the rest of the sin that's still in you and avoiding the false solutions and deploying the true ones? I am, so I'm going to keep going. Um, the first one. How we need to admit that we're not living in God's way. This is, this is one of James's big critiques. Um, but I want to uh, reference a couple other bits of scripture. The first is Romans chapter 7. There's that beautiful and really dense piece where Paul says, um, I try to do the right things, but I can't do them. You know the bit I'm talking about? He says, um, I desire to do what is right, but I can't carry it out. I do not do what is right because of the sin that dwells in me. Yeah? yeah. Sin's not exterior to us. It's not something that attacks us. It's something that dwells in us. Did you catch that in James chapter 1? There's this moment where he describes um, uh, desire. Do you remember that bit? It says, um, verse 14 I think, But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Desire is in your members, yeah? And then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when that sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. That happens in you. Yes? Another scripture I want to reference is Genesis chapter 4. This is a chilling verse, and it's chilling because it comes from the mouth of God. God is speaking to Cain at this moment. He says, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Yeah? The thing that God is telling us in this metaphor is that sin crouches. Why do you crouch? Because you don't want to be obvious, and you don't want to be seen. What we try to do, we try to implement this thing where we squish sin. We say that, you know, most, my sins aren't that bad. Yeah? Anyone think like that? We say things like, I'm not irritable. I've just got high standards. <laughs> yeah? yeah? That's squishing our, that's squishing our sin. We're irritable. We're annoyed with people. We should be loving and blessing those who persecute us. But we get irritable. We've got to own that that's sin. We can't do that. If my identity is as a good person, because I'm, I'm dealing with all of this stuff, but if my identity is in Christ, then yeah, I get it. And yeah, I want to work on it. And I need him to come and help me change it. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Another thing, I'm, this is something that I was thinking about. I've heard people say recently, I'm not stingy, I'm just Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. I love Scotland. I don't get that. Well, the other one I've heard recently, and I hear it, I've only heard it in New Zealand, I've never heard a Scottish person say that. The other one I hear is, I'm Dutch. Do you, get that? Do you hear people say that? You know? You're stingy. You're not generous. You're not being abundant. God is abundant. He gives you so many good things to share. But we're stingy. We've got to own that that's what we're doing. We're holding things because we don't want to take risks. Because we want to control everything. That's a sin. That's stopping God's abundance spread out through the world, isn't it? But we diminish it. It's crouching at the door. It's crouching like a little attacking animal. But it's crouching within us, and it births within us. We need to know this, and we feel awkward about talking about this, because we don't have our identity in Jesus. 
If our identity is in Jesus, it doesn't matter. I've got this issue. I'll tell you now, I've got massive issues with pride. That's one of my gigs. I really struggle when I fail. Really struggle. I get nervous when I'm preparing a sermon because I fear I might fail it. But it's okay for me to say that because that's not my identity. My identity is not as a preacher. My identity is in the fact that I'm loved by God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. More of those. <laughs> He's our resident panty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, second thing. We've got to avoid the false solutions. Um, we've got to gr grasp, right, that... Um, uh, the, what, we, what we normally do when we try to change is we normally try to change um, so that we avoid the consequences of sin. We don't try to change sin. I don't really need to talk about this very much because we all know it, but I'm going to. Okay? I'm going to share a story that's very vulnerable for Billy and I. We have a... Uh, we've got a... Um, oh shoot, we've got a couple, uh, some really close friends of ours. Um, uh, and they... Um, he abused his wife. I'm not talking about physically, I'm not talking about sexually, I'm talking about um, not being present with her. I'm talking about them not sharing their money with each other, withholding it. I'm talking about them lying to each other. I'm talking uh, about them running each other down the whole time. And uh, one of the fruits of this um, that was happening in secret, one of the fruits of this was that she ran to another man for love. Uh, because this other man told her that she was beautiful and that she was worth his time and his money. They can understand that, eh? When this became known and the danger of public disgrace and shame to them both, they went through a radical change. He moved back to this country to be present with her. He began to spend money on his wife. And he was present, rather than playing computer games. And it went on for a few weeks. And we had been praying for them every day for a long time. And it felt like this was the change that was going to happen. And then suddenly the marriage was over and they both moved out. And it's done. You see, the problem here was that the consequences were being sorted out. The threat of shame was there. The difficulty of losing one's wife to another man. And those were solved by changing behaviours. But behaviour change never leads to change. Mm. I'll say that again. Behaviour change never leads to change. It's got to be deeper than that. His heart wasn't changed. His love wasn't changed. If he loved his wife or if she loved him, they would have changed everything for that. Yeah? But they change to avoid shame, which is really about loving the image they produce. James is really clear about this. In verse 21, this is a really powerful um, verse. I, I suggest you, you memorize it. There's lots of verses in James I suggest you memorize. But this one here is, it says, Therefore rid yourself of all sordidness, yeah? of everything that's muck. And he says, rid yourself of all sordidness and the rank growth of wickedness. It grows in you. Yes? Are you with me? It grows in you. And the rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word which has with it the power to save our souls. Isn't that amazing? We have this stuff that's growing in us. I remember having a conversation with a friend who, um, uh, again, his, he had a relationship breakdown. Um, uh, he was engaged uh, to this lovely girl and part of their church. Um, and then they were driving to go, I think, meet her parents um, for a weekend. And um, uh, he was, they were driving down the motorway and he started confessing um, the sins that he had done um, with his previous girlfriends and his addiction to pornography. And he confessed it to her because he needed to share that with her so that she would, know, she would know. And she went berserk. She started smacking him in the face whilst they were driving 100 miles an hour down the motorway. Yeah. She threw the ring at him. He had to pull the car over. And they almost died in the process. It was horrendous. The following day, when he didn't go off on the weekend with his now no longer fiancée, he said, Caleb, I need to see you. And he sat opposite me at Pizza Hut. 
in Nottingham city centre. And we sat there and he sat across the table from me and he said, if you've got any issues with pornography, if you've got any issues with anything, deal with it now. Deal with it now because it can't grow. You need to deal with that. I've never heard anyone speak so sincere. The rank growth of wickedness just infects us. We don't face it because our identity isn't being good people. We think that we need to weigh the scales well at the end of time, but we don't. Because at the end of time, he doesn't look at our deeds, he looks at Jesus's. Yeah? At the end times, we'll stand before the judge, the judge who said, you're worth me giving my life for. We'll stand before him and he'll see us clothed in white. You don't have to worry about your muck. You just got to deal with it. Do you know what I mean? When our identity is in him, then I can own that I've got muck. And I don't have to squish it and pretend it's not there. I can deal with it. I can deal with it because his grace is enough. Because his blood cleanses every stain of sin. Amen. 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 Thanks. More panties in the house. I'm getting distracted. Here's a little thought from Tim Keller. Tim Keller I heard recently talking about Deuteronomy chapter 4. There's this moment in Deuteronomy chapter 4 where Moses says um, to the people of Israel, he says, God didn't choose you because you were a great nation. It's one of those humiliating speeches, you know. He says, not that you're a great nation. In fact, you're the least of all nations, is what he says. But I chose you because I chose you because I chose you. Yeah? That's divine elect love. Tim Keller then goes on to say, at some point in your life, your wife's going to come to you and say, do you love me? Mm. And we're going to say, he said, you know, you husbands out there, you're going to say, yeah, I, yeah, I love you. And then she's going to ask the next question. Why do you love me? <laughs> this one's slightly more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and perhaps we might say something like, because you're beautiful, because I love you. Your hair, I love you know the sexual chemistry we've got, I love the way we talk, I love that we share coffee and walk on beaches together, I love the way you parent. Now she's not very smart, she might actually like hearing those things, but then she'll think, what if I gain weight? What if I lose my hair? What if our parents leave home, our kids leave home and we, I'm not parenting anymore? You know what I mean? What if I can't walk on the beach anymore? If my friend had loved his wife because he loved his wife, because he loved his wife, he would have reorientated himself to stopping. He would have been able to own his mistakes and go to the core of the problem. It's deep down. I'm going to suggest a couple of solutions. But those are the wrong solutions. Squishing it, pretending it's not there, denying it, trying to master it. You can't. Just. Yeah. Two things from the book of James. First is, do you remember that bit where he talks about looking in the mirror? Yeah? Those who look in the mirror and then walk away and forget what they look like. Mm -hmm. What he's talking about there is the brutal facts of what's going on in your soul. Instead of diminishing your sin, let's look at what it really is. Yeah? It's fine to do this because he loves us. His love for us is not dependent on whether we've done good or bad. His love for us is because he loves us because he loves us. Yeah? So the, so, the, so the first thing we need to do is we need to look in the mirror. Take a stock check of your habits. And the best way to do this is to ask those who are closest to you. Because <laughs> you diminish them. Yeah? I'm not stingy, Caleb. I'm, I'm, you know, I look after my money well. Do you know what I mean? But your spouse or your brother or sister would tell you otherwise. Yes? We need to own what they are. For example, um, I had to ask some people what some of my habits are. I still need to because I deny that a bunch of them are there. One of my habits is that when I fail, I justify. Anyone else do that? I find myself so quickly explaining why I made a mistake. Because it wasn't my fault. I couldn't have made a mistake. Do you know what I mean? That's just pride, Caleb. That's just you thinking that you're better than other people. Or those you worry that you're not. Anyone worry that you're not good enough? Yeah? Ask people. Get them to tell you and own that that's what it is. When you look at Jesus, you can go, that's okay. 
That is one of my sins, and I'm going to work on that. Jesus, I need your grace to work on that. Perhaps you're someone who is fearful and has anxiety. Perhaps you get worried about things, that when you've got something new coming up, it cripples you, and you, know, you overeat, or you say things you shouldn't say, or whatever. Get the people closest to you to tell you, and then you can deal with it. Yeah? Because we diminish it. That's why we need people. Later on in James, he talks about confessing the sins to one another. Yeah? Perhaps you're someone who always goes to victim. You know what I mean by that? When you say, oh, this always happens to me. Yes? That's a big thing in our culture. Pretty much everybody loves being victim. It's worse for you than it's been for anyone else ever in history. You know, but we do that. We do that, don't we? You know, when something happens to us, we go, oh, you know, and my work colleagues could help me. Sorry, I didn't want to just switch myself off. <laughs> Okay. I did, sorry Dale. <laughs> I can own my sin, you see. <laughs> um, uh, the, so that's the, that's the first one. So the first is you need to own what is wrong, yeah? You need to look in the mirror and you need to be brave with it, okay? The second is don't get down on yourself thinking you're all bad, okay? That's what we tend to do at these moments, don't we? We just go, oh, I'm just such a terrible person. That's, that's, you know, that's because you've got your identity tied up with being a good person, yeah? That's just knock that on its head. Spend lots of time with Jesus remembering that. But this is the second thing I want to say, is um, uh, learn to convict yourself with joy. I love that word. James chapter 1 verse 1, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. It's like that wonderful verse in Hebrews chapter 12 where it says, um, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame. He scorned his shame. It didn't, it didn't cause him, you know, like internal worry. He's on the cross not worrying. You ever thought about that? He's at peace on the cross. Because for the joy set before him, he scorned his shame. I love that verse. When I'm stuck in my pride and my reputation, I need to look at his journey of joy and his journey of grace. Yes? So when I'm worried about being humiliated or doing something wrong, what I need to do is I need to spend time at the foot of the cross, where I look at the place where he gave up all power and glory, where he was humiliated and enthroned in humiliation, with a crown of thorns forced upon his head. When I look at that image of him, when I look at that, I fall in love with him again. Yeah? And then it makes me realize that humility is actually beautiful. Microphone's coming. I'm almost the end of my son. Are we back alive? Okay. Um, do you get with me? Like, so perhaps, perhaps your issue is that fear or anxiety one. Then spend some time meditating on what it looked like for him in the garden. He's there in the dust, face down. He's flung himself at his father's feet. The weight of the world and all sin of all history is coming upon him, so much so that he's, bl he's sweating blood. And he's in that turmoil, and in that place, he boldly declares, not my will, but yours be done. He says that without fear. Yes? When you've got fear and anxiety, isn't it so good to be with someone who's fearless? Don't you get courage when you're with someone who's fearless? Go to that place. Convict yourself with joy. The last one I want to say is, if you sit in that victim place where you don't think, uh, where you think everything's coming against you, then imagine him and his trial and his trial and his trial, where they spat at him, where they abused him, where they beat him, where they hurled lies against him, where they said all kinds of evil against him, and he stood in silence. Yeah? When you see him there, you can let go of your victimhood. It's okay for people to blame you or for things to go wrong. Are you with me? Convict yourself with joy. So take a look in the mirror and convict yourself with joy. All of this is based on that we orientate ourselves first and foremost to being a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the place we need to come.
Let's just do that now. Let's have a time of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we come before you as we are. And we come before you trying to be good, trying to look hard and failing. We come to you with all of our sordidness and the rank growth of wickedness in us. And we ask that you would reveal more of your beauty and more of your love, that we would see that we are written on your heart. Come, Holy Spirit. Help us see what we're really like. And help us to see who we really are. We are yours, Lord. In Jesus' perfect, powerful name we pray. Amen.